Okay, so let's to get started. Uh, I'm sure I don't have to convince any of you that you should have a home library. Um, so we're going to talk more about like how do we choose, where do we invest our money. But I think even more importantly is what do we put in our home on the shared space, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure we're using it well. So um, let's let's uh, go through that. But first, let's do a little imagination project. <clears throat> what would your life look like if the internet disappeared tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. So we're gonna just go from that assumption. We're gonna we're gonna talk. I'm gonna talk from the assumption that we're not fans of the internet. We're not going. We, we acknowledge that it has its uses and advantages, but when it comes to the education of our children and our own mental health, we would be fine if it disappeared tomorrow, right? <laughs> well, online, okay, online classes and all that, but okay, so, but still, we're just, we're just gonna try, we're gonna try enter into this world where there is no internet. Um, <clears throat> And then, and then imagine this, what would your life be like without a phone? <laughs> True, okay, yeah, sure, because some of you wouldn't be here, got it, <laughs> that, that makes sense. Um, but imagine like getting up in the morning and being with your kids and like phones don't exist, internet doesn't exist, and we're just, we're together in this, in this room and we're going to be learning, reading. So what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do with our time? Pardon me? Except in the 90s, we read a book. Well, that's the thing. In the 90s, we would have read a book. Like evening rolls around and it's after dinner and everybody cleans up and you go to the sitting room and y'all grab your books and read, right? That's what we do, right? Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, there's right here, Angelina. I reserved it just for you. <laughs> Did you want to grab something? Okay. Welcome. Welcome. Okay. Um, so the last time we met here, um, I gave a talk on how we define classical education. And then something that I brought out in that talk is how we are people of the word. Or we are children of the word made flesh. Um, as John chapter 1 points out, Jesus is the word incarnate. Now, let's draw that out a little further. Because for him to be the word incarnate, he had to exist beforehand. Um, and in that sense, too, words, once we speak them, once they come out of our mouths, that's actually the final end of the product, right? We've already done our thinking. We've conceived in our minds what it is we want to think, and then we speak. Um, Dorothy Sayers writes about that quite at length in her book, um, Mind of the Maker. And she talks about us as image bearers of God. We've been equipped to use words. But do we know how to use words? That's the question. Do we know how? Because, because if we're made in the image of God. And if we've been equipped to use words, and Jesus is the word incarnate, why are we in a world that is so messed up? Like, why have we been misusing words? Um, and, and why are there so many words now that are, that are pretty much useless? Um, so while these words are being poured into our heads, um, we have come to a point almost where we're, we're exhausted. We have no tranquility in our minds. We're not, we're not stopping it. We're just in a sense coping with it, with these words coming at us all day long. And in some sense, we don't have time anymore to even stop and, uh, to stop and, um, deliberately and, plan what it is what is it that I am going to read what is it that I'm going to allow in front of myself and in front of my children um, so so that's something but that's something we can do as we decide what we want to do with our with our books uh, and what we want to put in our homes so what what does that have to do with books I I think it has everything to do with them books are not just a distraction they're not just a diversion or something to um, whittle away the time. I think we've got enough of that going on around us. But books are some books are someone else's time that's being invested in you. 
So someone else um, had an idea or had a thought or had a story, and they were so compelled to communicate that that they stopped everything and they took time to put those words down on paper and to have them put out to you. Now, does that mean that every single word that's been written is something that we should read because somebody took the time to write it? Well, well, absolutely not. But there are some words that have been written and they've been written thousands of years ago and they're still available to us today. They're still on paper. And, and perhaps we should think about how important it might be then if these words written thousands of years ago are still available to us today should we perhaps think about reading those? So a good place to start then when we're, when we're thinking about our collection is actually with children's books. And this is the fun thing about homeschooling is because we start with children. Um, the, one of the things about children's books is that it's short um, and it can help us with our short attention spans in, in this day and age. Um, and we can actually read through a book in a sitting and we can kind of determine, is this something I want? or don't want with to read for my children. Another thing that's really helpful with children's literature is art. Um, and I am actually of the opinion that you absolutely can judge a book by its cover. Absolutely. The art actually makes all the difference. <clears throat> um, so if we, if we start them with children's books, and we, then we start with, uh, we're essentially starting with attention span. And I find that's even helpful for myself. I find that, like, especially with phones and with Facebook and with Twitter and all this, like, even, even news articles, they're getting shorter and shorter, right? And so how do, we, how do we grow our own attention span so that we can actually sit down with a classic story and have the discipline to read through it without getting bored? So as we move through our children's books, we move on to teenage and adult books, um, then we're, we're training ourselves and our children to spend more time with the book. A children's book, sit down, read it, put it away, you're done. Something a little bit more intense, Paddington Bear, it's going to take a little bit longer. We're going to have to sit through it for a little bit longer. Be because that physical act of actually sitting and reading a book, it actually takes practice. Um, and, and we're not going to go straight from Paddington Bear to Dante's Divine Comedy. Um, I don't think that's realistic. Um, and so if you're someone who's like, I really want to read the classics and I really want to read Divine Comedy, don't think that you can just tomorrow pick it up and start reading it. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some effort. But we do. But at the same time, we do want to dispel that belief of somebody who would pick up like Anna Karenina and go, oh, I could never read that. Right. That's you. You can't maybe today. But you also aren't going to go run a triathlon, you know, after a diet of the year of donuts, it's not gonna happen. These things take time and effort. <clears throat> so, um, so that's for that reason, when we're, when we're looking at where we put our money, what are we gonna buy? We're gonna start slow and easy. Um, and by challenging our own attention spans and our mental capacity, um, we can do that with um, starting with some of those classic stories. Um, and, and again, with the classics, um, those are, time tested books those are the ones that we actually do want to buy we want to invest in those and we want to put those on our shelves but what you'll also what you'll find with the classics as well and especially in in in, in more recent years um, many authors have taken some of these longer classics and some of these older classics and they've rewritten them in a in a sort of prose and in a modern way that makes it easy for us to read um, the ones that i can think about for example are um like the Iliad and the Odyssey, awesome books, we should all read them, but that's a pretty big deal. So there's, uh, there's an author, Alfred Church, and a while ago he wrote these books, The Iliad for Boys and Girls, or The Odyssey for Boys and Girls. Another author who's done that, an excellent author, is um, Rosemary Sutcliffe. She's written Black Ships of Troy. Um, so these are, I think, it's, I think it's actually really important to have at least one volume on your shelf that is a um, a version for children, a classic, but it's a, it's about a classic, but it's a version written for children. It, what it will do is it will help them and it will help us to understand the story and to get familiar with the story. And because these are classic stories, what you'll find is we actually like them. We actually want to read them again. So once we understand and have a summary of it, we'll likely go on to read the classics when they're teenagers, when they're a little bit older. <clears throat> Um, 
so, but then there's so many classics. So where do we start? Do we buy them all? Do we have buy just some of them? Um, but what I would suggest, where I would suggest you should start is, um, aside from Bibles and Bible commentaries and Bible study books, those should be on your shelf. You should be buying those. That's just a given. Um, something that you consider and look into is um, a, a set of books called the Harvard Classics. And it's a set of 50 books. Um, it was edited by the president of Harvard, President Charles Eliot. But here's the key. It was published in 1909 and 1910. So in this day and age, we, we want to be looking at books that are published pre-1970, 1950. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about contemporary later, but for the most part, when I'm talking classics, we want to look at the, the pub, think books that are published earlier. Um, so, the, But the Harvard classics, the reason why the Harvard classics are interesting is because um, Dr. Elliot, he determined that that set of books, what's in those 50 volumes, is what every human being can potentially read in the comfort of their own home. And if they read that, then they will have a very well-rounded liberal arts education. Um, and there's more, there's more to it. Here's the biggest secret of all. As I'm sure you can imagine, these books are not very welcome anymore in, in public. You won't find them in the libraries. You won't find them in bookstores anywhere. Where you will find them is in the used marketplace. And it will, they're very cheap because nobody wants them. So I got a set a few years ago. I paid $50 for 50 hardcover, absolutely gorgeous books. So I would strongly urge you to go find a set um, and put that on your shelves for starters, because <clears throat> it's going to cost you almost no money. You're going to be preserving culture because we need to find these and save them. And you will have the start of an excellent liberal arts education on your bookshelf. Um, now, whether you're actually going to read them all or your children are going to read them all, that's another question. They don't necessarily have to. Like what Dr. Elliot, while I appreciate his efforts and his work putting um, all, all his work in, into that, that collection, um, I think what that represents, I've, I've read this in a New York Times article once and I, it just resonated so strongly with me. The books on our shelves um, aren't always there for us to read them. They are there to help us reach to be a better person or they represent the person that we want to become or the person that we're moving towards. So put the 50 volumes of the Harvard Classics on your shelf is to say, uh, I'd like to read that someday, maybe not today, and I may not even get to it in my lifetime, but that's where I'm going. So that's where we can start. Uh, if you find a set, nab it. If you find two sets, call a friend, tell them to nab it. Yeah, in most cases, it's published as a beautiful set. All the, co all the volumes look the same. Generally, it's hardcover. Um, it's like an is exactly it. It's like an encyclopedia, and they all all the volumes have a number on them as well, and they're they're like a collection of um, of different works. So there's like one of them is a collection of poetry, like from the American uh, from the American literature, and one of them is a set of. Um, I was just reading through some of the yeah a set of short stories. So not every book is a volume or a collection, um, but it really sets you in the right direction. So one of the things that you can do with those is um, take one of their volumes on poetry and read through some of them. And if you find that one of the poets resonates well, then go buy a volume of that person's poetry and put that on your shelf, right? So to have that collection, that, that's like your spine, right? The other thing is, again, with that collection, with that series of books, you can decide if you want to buy um, a, a version that's been written, that's been rewritten for children to access it. So <clears throat> it's just it's just an excellent way to start, an excellent place to go. We've read, um, and I would say too, make sure like make sure you always have a collection of poetry as well. There's some really good collections like Chris, uh, Christina Rossetti.
was an excellent children's poet. So something like that have children's poetry, but also some of this um, other poetry by adults. Um, so, in, But then in addition to these classics, we, we should have books on mythology. Uh, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, Norse mythology, Egyptian mythology, all the mythologies. Um, and those two can be, th those are very accessible um, by the Delaires. Um, Ingrid and her husband Delaire wrote these lovely um, collections. They're really nicely illustrated. Those are really worth your money. The illustrations, again, the art matters. Um, the illustrations in those books are really good. Um, so there's those, but then if you want a little bit more advanced um, mythology, there's something like Edith Hamilton. And she writes these absolutely gorgeous volumes that are a summary of mythologies, but then she also has a collection about all the different gods, what are their names and who they were. Um, so she's she's a great author to follow. Um, or Padraic Colum is a good one as well. So he's rewritten some of the mythologies um, for kids. And those ones are not so much like Aeneid for boys and girls. These are just like the mythologies, like um, Jason and the Golden Fleece, those sorts of things. And so th those are really good to read as well. I would say Usborne, Usborne Books also has, often has good summaries. Again, Usborne, gotta be careful with them. Um, if you can get older copies, older uh, volumes, if they're published like pre even 1990, Usborne summaries are, are pretty good. Osborne actually has a collection of Shakespeare, complete Shakespeare, um, that's been rewritten. And my, I, I happened upon it one time, and I now have a daughter who spouts Shakespeare constantly. <laughs> I would say the thing about mythology, though, is that we want to be careful that we stay away from books that write about mythology, but use it as a license for immorality. Uh, the mythology is full of immorality. There's no question about it. But it's only useful if, if there is, if that immorality is correctly dealt with, right? If there is sin and it is punished and whoever sinned has to suffer the consequences of these poor decisions, that that's the point, right? So for that reason, Percy Jackson is not something that's welcome in our home. Um, my daughters read it for a little bit. And as we talked about it, I said, thing, I would ask them the questions that I ask, like, <clears throat> who do you identify with? Or what ultimate good is the character pursuing? Or, and the answers I got were very confused looks of like, there is no virtue. There is murder happening without, um, without it being punished. Uh, so, so mythology especially can be used to glorify bad behavior and immorality. So we, we, we want to be careful about that. Um, another genre we want to have a lot of on our shelves is fairy tales. Uh, and I think we've all heard of like Anderson fairy tales and Grimm's fairy tales, and those are really good. But we want to be careful that we don't have modern translations of fairy tales, especially since Disney, because sorry to break it to you, but Disney ruined fairy tales. Um, has anyone read The Little Mermaid, like the original Little Mermaid fairy tale? Yes, she does not, in fact. Yes. She doesn't get her voice back. <laughs> Let's put it that way. How about Beauty and the Beast? Anybody read the original Beauty and the Beast? Yeah. Uh, it's Let's just say it's not quite that romantic. It's, no. But at the same time, when you read the originals, then you understand, like, the purpose of the fairy tales. It's not meant to be this romantic driving off, like, riding off into the sunset happily ever after tale. It's meant to tell us the story of the moral consequences that exist, like natural moral consequences. And there are things that you can't, you can't break those laws. You can't break moral laws. You can try, but the consequences inevitably come back. Um, so, so I'd say fairy tales. Um, but the best collections of fairy tales are those that have been compiled by Andrew Lang. <laughs> That's all good, all good. <laughs> um, 
<clears throat> so Andrew Lang, he didn't write fairy tales, but he collected them. He collected them from all over the world. So there's fairy tales from India, from Asia, from the Persian um, cu cultures. And uh, in fact, he collected so many of them and he printed so many volumes that he couldn't tell the volumes apart. He didn't remember what fairy tale was in which volume. So in order to tell them apart, he named them by colors. So there's the blue fairy book. That's the one you should start with. We recommend with the blue fairy book. But then you could read the orange fairy book and the red fairy book and the purple fairy book and the yellow fairy book and the green fairy book. And it goes on like that. It is so cool. Um, and got, they're very diverse. I have some of them. I, there's so many of them. So we just have some. Just the colors I like. <laughs> just, the missing, missing just the blue one. <laughs> just the blue one. <laughs> um, so, so Andrew Lang is good, um, and Grimm's, Grimm's and Anderson are good too, but just make sure you get like the real ones, not the, not the, not, not the Disney find ones. Um, okay. So, um, some, I my, my, I'm missing a page. Okay. So, so we covered poetry, mythology, we covered fairy tales. Um, and the, another one that we really want to cover is historical fiction. So historical fiction is a very important genre. It's actually one of my favorite genres of literature. Um, but historical fiction is a little bit difficult to navigate because the author of historical fiction is going to write from a bias and a perspective. Our modern news media is telling us all about that. So <clears throat> again, it's really helpful to think about publication dates. When you're looking to purchase a book, look at the publication dates. Things pre-1990 are fairly safe, but when it comes to historical fiction, even Canadian historical fiction, 1970, pre-1970, that's where we find some good stuff. But even so, we still have to be careful. With historical fiction, you just have to be careful. Uh, for example, um, a book that comes to mind is Uncle Tom's Cabin. That is a very controversial book because it deals with a very controversial pe time period and mm -hmm. controversial ethics. Um, we all have opinions about whether you should have slaves or not. However, neither you nor I live in a culture that has slaves or had slaves or lived with these people or knew anything about having them in, in our lives. So for us to read a book like Uncle Tom's Cabin coming from the perspective of that was wrong, they never should have done that is not helpful, right? When we come to a historical story, a historical narrative, we need to come to that narrative to an author that we trust, that we, or at, at the very least that we know has tried to be as, um, as, as, as unbiased as possible, which is it's impossible, completely unbiased, but we, we need to understand the bias. And then we need to read what that author wants to tell us. Just, just listen. Just listen. Um, and what we'll find is that we could actually learn about the people of that time, the decisions that they had to make, um, and that the, 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 the uh, circumstances in which they made these decisions. And what we may find is that if we are back there in that time, in that culture, the decisions that we would have made then would be different than the, the same decisions that we make here in our culture in this time. The, you can't, because you can't take yourself and your circumstances and extrapolate that over all of history. This is also why historical fiction is important for our kids, because as they read through these stories, they can ask questions, well, why did they do that? Good question. Let's go find out. So um, the other, the other, um, period of history that's really interesting is what motivated the Europeans to cross over the ocean, um, which we know is, it, it was trade, it was commerce. Uh, but when they did, they find a brand new land. And how did they deal with that? They saw new peoples and new resources, and it was an opportunity for a new economy. How did they deal with that? Uh, you can't even imagine how their minds would have been blown to A, travel far enough that they got to another land and then be we should be reading the fiction we should be listening to the stories but and at the younger ages the fiction is more important because 
when they get to those teenage years, maybe a little bit older, we actually want them to read the original writings. Like I want my kids to read Christopher Columbus's journals and diaries. I want them to understand what he himself was thinking, right? Now, whether we agree with that or not, is off the, it's just off the table. We're not at the point right now where we're doing rhetoric or politics or anything like that. We're just listening. We're just listening to the story. We're listening to the people who were there. Um, or say the period of a history that's commonly known as the Dark Ages, like depending where you go. But the early Middle Ages can be referred to as the Dark Ages. Well, why is that? Why do we call it the Dark Ages? There wasn't a lot of writing, that's true. Um, there was a lot of warfare. Mm -hmm. There were tribes battling back and forth. There was a lot of illness, a lot of illness. Um, and so uh, so it's considered it's considered the dark ages. There it also comes after like the, the Roman era, the Ro the the Roman the fall of Rome. And the Romans, of course, had that pre-Rome was was Greece. We had Rome, we had um, like the, the the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and these cultures actually produced quite a bit of art and, and philosophy and a lot of different things. And then we just have this period of time where like, it's, it is as if nothing happened, right? So what it's worth, I was taught that the world was historically a couple degrees colder and people were just trying to survive. Right. Like several hundred years. It's the right. Same. Okay. And that, I think that I think that's actually quite true, right? Because the thing is, when we don't have time for leisure, then we can't create, yeah. right? And so it's, it's true that there was a period of time there where um, there were so much loss and so much, um, like the barbarians were just destroying so much that it was down to these people surviving in their communities and just, just living to find the next meal, right? But something that was happening was that Christianity was spreading like the fastest it's ever spread. And we know that because we've got this period of time where like it's like nothing, nothing, nothing. And then all of a sudden like, ta-da, there's Raphael. Like, where did that come from, right? How did that happen? And then Ma Michelangelo's out there. So where did that come from? Well, during the dark ages, if you will, something has to have been happening. The gospel was going out. There was the warrior was fighting for freedom so that his son could be the merchant who could start providing food again for the community so that his son could be the artist because now he had leisure, right? So there's a fascination. I just have a fascination with history and these historical periods that, and we can learn about this in history when we look at these individual lives of like the warrior whose son becomes the merchant, whose son becomes the, the poet. Um, and and it's, it's, um, it's up to us, in a sense, to help our children be the poet, right? We might not be the warriors, we might be the merchants, we might be the poets, but at whatever the case, wherever we are, we want our children to be the ones who are creating, because that means they have the leisure time. But if they have the leisure time to create, we want to make sure that at this, this time when they're growing up, we're filling them up, we're just, we're enriching them so that, who knows, outbursts of Raphael in a few years. Um, okay, so we've talked about historical fiction. We've talked about poetry and mythology. Okay, then there's literature. Um, the genre of literature, like like novels and things, kind of bursts upon us and proliferates in the British modern era, like Victorian era. Fascinating thing that, that like, so you've got Charles Dickens. He's interesting and very wordy. Um, and then you have someone coming on the scene her, uh, by the name of George Eliot. She writes, i uh, give it away. George Eliot writes a book called Silas Mariner. Fascinating books, very interesting, very insightful, very intuitive. Um, but George Eliot is a woman. And it's the time where women are actually not well read. Like women can't write books. And if they did, no one would want to read them, right? So she writes a book under George Eliot and she becomes very popular. And then the women who actually start to put their names on the book, who are brave enough to put their names on the books are Jane Austen, Jane Austen and... Uh, the Bronte sisters, right? Um, so what is it about their books that are so important? Why should we buy all the Jane Austen and all the Brontes? Because they're really good? That's great. That's a great answer. I'll take it. They're like relationally in tune, right? Relationally, yeah. They're relationally in tune, yes. Yes. They tell us about 
the human being, the human condition. So we could either decide that we're going to take our child to a course of human psych through a course of human psychology in grade 10, or we could read Jane Austen. I don't know. I, I know what I'm going to do, but <laughs> um, so that's the, that's the fascinating thing about but literature is it helps us to understand um, the, the human responses. If you think about uh, Pride and Prejudice, you meet the gossip, the very proud person, the flatterer, the really shy, can't get out of the corner person, the bold person. Like you meet all of the characters. And as you meet these characters, you're like, I know these people. They're my friends. <laughs> like some of them. <laughs> We won't put names to them. <laughs> um, so that that's the importance of literature. So we want to we want to buy that old literature. And we want to read that with our kids. Um, now, when it comes to the more contemporary books, that's where I would say, like contemporary novelists or contemporary literature, I would say that's where I start to slow down on the purchasing and the buying. Like, I mean. Do I really want Harry's face on my bookshelf? I don't know. I don't. Um, there's a few people that I think are really important, a few modern day authors. Um, but again, the people who are writing now, who are telling our stories now, they are not time tested. They are, we don't know yet if this is something that's going to stick around or not. Some of them we do. And one such author is actually Wendell Berry. Has anybody heard of Wendell Berry? Yes, yes, we, you've seen them here, yes. Wendell Berry, um, he, he actually changed my whole perspective on community, on like loyalty, on um, what it means to, to, to be a part of a community, to be a part of a family. He changed all of that. Um, but his books aren't so much about like how to do that or how to be that. His books are merely the story of a community in Kentucky and he <clears throat> writes about various characters, the barber, the farmer, the housewife, and just just how they, how culture changed from pre-war times till today. Um, and he points out that industry and even education, as, as kids grew up and they flew across the country to go to university and college, they never came back. They just didn't, right? And then the family farms were dying. But then we didn't, some of the family farms, they didn't, weren't there for the kids anyway because the farmers bought tractors and expanded and grew and they just didn't need the kids because, well, we didn't have chickens anymore because they were too much work because all we did was raise massive amounts of grain. And it just, the, the, the culture just slowly but surely disintegrated. And then interstate highways came in and they literally separated communities because now you couldn't walk from this community to this community. So now there's this massive barrier between. So, so in his stories, the way he points out the loss of that culture, he's pointing out a problem that we are all in today and that we're all, I believe, as homeschooling families trying to resolve and say, hey guys, we, that we, we want that. We want to go back. I want chickens again. I, I, want, I want them. Um, and, and I want more books. Um, but... He's point. I don't. I don't know what the solution is, but it's really important to us today because it tells us what happened. It tells us why we are where we are today, and perhaps gives us a tiny little glimmer into how what we need to do to restore that. What we need to do to get back to that culture where we support each other as communities. Um, so, so somebody like that is really important. And and then with someone like that, what we can do is we can listen to him, we can follow him, we can listen, like, what does Wendell Berry read? Because if whatever he reads, I'm reading that too, right? Um, so, and, and there's other people like that. Someone else I really like to follow is Karen Swallow Pryor. She's actually a liter uh, literature um, professor. She was, I don't think she's teaching now, but I just find her quite fascinating to listen to. And when she t talks about a book or a story, I'm, that gets my attention. I may or may not buy it uh, because it's, again, it's modern, um, but I may buy it and share it around and and it may be good for for a for, for a time, if you will. Um, so that's kind of the philosophy of the idea. I want to talk a little. It's got the words in it. It'll get the job done. It's thirteen dollars, right? Then we have this one. Mm. <laughs> 
That's what I thought. This one is hardcover. And just like the, the feel, the pages are glossy. It has colored pictures in it. And this one is, well, it's 50. <laughs> It's on her bookshelf. <laughs> I think it depends on the purpose. Like, if I'm reading it, I'm getting the first one because I only read the fifth. Right. And I'm not going to drop that on my face. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you would get a bruise. But I would buy the yeah. because I want to educate my children in beautiful things. And yeah. They're worth it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I think, yeah. Yeah. Throwing that out there. <laughs> yes. There is a soft cover version. Beautiful, but also soft cover. So, there is a mean. I, I don't I don't pay her to say <laughs> although I will say she is the single most dangerous person in this bookstore if you're gonna buy books don't talk to her don't talk to her she will not save you money no that's true she yeah that's true she will do that um so but I just wanted to point that out because um if we're investing in our libraries and it's going to be for possibly multiple children maybe like $50 is a hefty price tag for a book but how much pardon me it's a classic, it's a classic and how much is that per page? well per page and per, <laughs> and per child per year well this is the thing right book reader, book reader. <laughs> book reader. <laughs> Um, so, but the, but that we do have to take that into consideration because we do have we all have budgets and we all have space limitations. And I think there's going to be times when yes, we're going to put the money on that. Like that's an incredibly outstanding book, book of the Hobbit, right? Now there's other classics that like Uncle Tom's Cabin, for example, where um, I want to have it, but I'm okay with like the thirteen dollar volume, right? So it's it really is going to depend on the book. Um, uh, but assess, but assess that and budget for that and 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 look for those nice ones. If you're going to buy one, it's, if it's a classic, look for the nice ones. Um, yeah. So that's like one of the technical things I wanted to bring out. Another one thing I wanted to bring out is the books that are less fun to buy. What are the books that are less fun to buy? Science. <laughs> okay, science. Yeah. But we do want to buy them. Well, no. Well, what about a what about a story like a, a story about the number zero, for example? I like the scout books. <laughs> um, how about books like dictionaries or thesauruses or encyclopedias? Yes, like eighteen sixty seven. Yes, exactly. Yes. Now, I don't think we always, I don't think we often think about those ones like a dictionary thesaurus or an encyclopedia. But remember what we started off with? Remember the question I gave you? What if we have no internet? How are you going to do your. And anyway, words are changing, the definition of words are changing so fast that I would actually like my children to know what the 1970s definition of these words are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So despite the fact that the internet isn't turning off tomorrow, I think it's really important to find old dictionaries, thesauruses, and encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. Now, another secret about those, they're not going to cost you very much. And the money you save on your Encyclopedia Britannica, you can put into your <laughs> hobbits. <laughs> there you go, right? <laughs> But I uh, know because I, I found, again, I found a whole set of Encyclopedia Britannica from 1970s with the yearbooks that were updated every year on the information. And again, I think that one cost me like 10 bucks because they were just going to throw it out. Because mm -hmm. yes. we got it free from the school. Someone posted on Facebook. A teacher was like, oh, we're getting rid of this mm -hmm. because they're not using them in school. Mm -hmm. Yes. Facebook Marketplace <laughs> is a fantastic place to find used books. Um, as is Rotary Club, yes. Oh, yes. Chilliwack Rotary Club. Now, don't y'all go there and buy the good books. <laughs> Someone's got a. I'm getting first dibs. <laughs> Tell you all the secrets. Um, library sales are also really good. Yes. I love that question. 
So that is I, like, first of all, audiobooks are legit. Okay, they're hundred percent legit. If I had the time to read all the books out loud to my children that I wanted to, I would, but I don't. And so I let other people do it. Um, audiobooks, I invest in ones that are very interesting, but I don't necessarily want to read them because I would be bored by them. Um, like Paddington Bear. I, it's, it's a lovely story, but I just, I can't, I can't, I just can't. Um, but then again, um, so when I'm talking, I was talking about attention spans earlier, how we want to lengthen our attention spans, right? Um, and especially for our kids too, like it's easy for them to be reading these, um, like Tuesdays at the Castle and Miss Mantle Chronicles and all these fun stories, easy, right? Yes. But then it comes to Lord of the Rings. You need, you need some help. Now, it's a fantastic story, and we want to read it, but oh my goodness, we call it getting stuck in the muck, right? So what we've done is, it's, it's, those, those are the kinds of books that I will buy audiobook for, and, and you have to make sure you get a good narrator, because boy, you can, if you get the bad narrators, it's, just, it's a double no, right? So a good narrator for a book that's going to take a bit more effort to read through or that that's where I'd put my money on audio. So follow up question to that. Our oldest is five. We've already done like Tuesdays in the Castle on audio. Should I be saving those kinds of things for when he's actually reading them? So that he doesn't know the story yet and he's more motivated? Or some of them. Some of them yes. <laughs> But some of them, yes, but some of them also, you want to be careful that you don't get him to listen to too high level maturity at his age, because there's so much at a five-year-old level that he should be listening to. Like there's Beverly Cleary's Mouse on the Motorcycle, there's Paddington Bear, there's Winnie the Pooh, there's like those stories. Like he needs, Winnie the Pooh is essential. Like it is absolutely essential. The the stories of love and loyalty um, in there and just like Pooh and Pingla's relationship. Yeah, he's oh. more the like dragon intensity. The two-year-old. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then maybe something like The Reluctant Dragon by Kenneth Graham, okay. those sorts of things. So, and Tuesdays at the Castle is actually really fun. And like, I think that's that's totally fine for a five-year-old, but you want to, you do want to be careful, um, especially with audiobooks. I don't like our <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just, you just want to be careful and conscious that, um, especially, yeah, your, your kids are going to be, they're going to be 10. And they have a whole year of listening to books. And then they're going to be 11. And then they have a whole year of listening to books. And they're going to be 12. So, yeah, stay at the age you're at. Now, it's hard as a mom of little kids. Because it, when you're struggling ages, but also when you have little kids, because you need something that's a little bit more entertaining. You need something that's not the same old, same old, right? Um, so that's where it does get hard. But I would encourage you to kind of keep the be mindful of the age limits and then it gets even more dicey when your kids are older because now you got like say the 14 year old who's wanting to listen to like watership down or yeah. dystopian fiction and you're like no the six-year-old may not hear may not hear <laughs> right yeah. so yes please do please do it was very frustrating to them because That's they were okay. wanting stuff that was like okay. like they were far away yeah. yeah so i found them sometimes finding fun stories that was closer to what they could read, to read. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so listening to an audio is maybe a great what they could actually she be uh -huh. yes unless that was like finding fun stories motivated them to be so okay. like oh i want to see what happens next yeah, yeah. the audio book i'm going to get the book oh, and i'm going to chug through it oh, yeah you're like three or four grade levels away there's They're no way you're going to chug through anything yeah, yeah. so i found that the hard way with three girls and two boys oh, okay. that i do i wouldn't go and jump way okay. ahead just for the exciting story. Yeah. And your kids are listening to it. Okay. Because then they're frustrated that they're still reading something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, I would, and I think, Anna, that's an extremely good point. So, what Anna is saying there is um, we don't want to give our kids who can't read, we don't want to expose them to these. To these
I would also suggest that we don't want to let our children only and always read books about dragons and exciting plot lines, because that's not reality. I remember um, that when I was when I was younger, every year we would get these books at Christmas. And I remember getting, when I was, I think, seven or eight, I got the book In Grandma's Attic. I don't know if you know that, but Arletta Richardson. And I hated it. <laughs> and the next year, you know what was worse? The next year, I got more stories from Grandma's Attic. <laughs> I got every year, I got a Grandma's Attic book every year. But what happened was that I started to read them. <laughs> um, because um, I was like, okay, like there's got to be something here. Like, what, why, why do they keep giving me this book? Um, and I realized that what I didn't like was that it was just kind of a story about a girl who does, who lives everyday life, and she gets into like it's 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 fun, it's adventurous and things. But but I wanted exciting all the time and always. I, I, yeah, and it's ordinary. Um, and as a parent, I actually find that the ordinary stories are what I want my kids to read, like the Vanderbeekers, right? And the, um, um, there's, uh, Hilda Van Stockham has this fantastic series called The Mitchells. Hilarious. A ordinary life, a mom with five kids, and it's all she can do to keep up, and her husband's off fighting in World War II or something like that, and they start these neighborhood clubs, and they're just the, these wonderful, mischievous kids, and he comes back from the war, and they move to the wood back back woodlands of Quebec and they don't have electricity but just it's fantastic um, and I love reading these stories now and so but but it took time for us to actually read them together as a family and I had to be like okay no sorry one chapter tonight non-negotiable we're reading this and and now we love it we like the ordinary stories so so I would say be mindful of the different genres that you're listening to and keep it as diversified as you can. You should be listening to, yeah, absolutely dragons and adventure, but you should be listening to historical fiction and you should be listening to the ordinary and you should be having some good literature in there. When they get a little bit older, dystopian fiction is great. Uh, mystery, put some mystery in there, but keep your genres diversified. Yes. I don't, this is not exactly on the topic you're speaking of, but you talked about it, the vocabulary. Vocabulary. I kind of find that or like definitions of words. Like yeah. lots of books we're reading. I'm like, we live in a completely different world than like outside my front door. And I yeah. don't ever bother to tell my kids that the words mean different things now. Like, yeah. you know, I don't know. Like, is that, is that bad? Like, Remember how I said buy a 1970s dictionary? Yeah, but like, do I bother to say, oh, this means something different nowadays or can I just read no. it like we're just reading it and we're enjoying it? Read it and enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> that uh, That's such an important question. The, the, political narrative of today and the wokeism that's seeping in is changing language. That's a problem because uh, by changing language, they're changing history. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if we allow them to change the language, then when we go back and read Uncle Tom's Cabin, it really is going to be a wicked book, mm -hmm. like really bad. Mm -hmm. But that person who wrote that book did not use those words in the way that we're using them today, mm -hmm. right? Um, and for that reason too, like I wanted to talk about like how do we approach a book that has different political views or perspectives than we do, right? So I think it's totally fine to let a child, a teenager at appropriate level to read something that's politically left wing, totally fine. <clears throat> but only if we've really grounded them in logic and rhetoric and literature and stories from the past, because we want them to be able to read the stories of the left and go, yeah, but that's not how it is. That's not how humans behave. And and this is a this is a straw man. They are painting a false picture here. This is not actually how society works or believes. Like if we want to talk about some of the the the, the issues around transgender and they want to make that normal, well, the reason why it's such a big deal is because it's unnatural and most people don't want it. That's just how it is, right? So we can pretend all we want that we have to accept it and make it normal, and um, but but the reality is human history will tell you it, it won't ever stick it it will eventually this is where like mythology has to show that immorality doesn't work because we're in an age where we've got some immorality and it's ultimately not going to work out for them but we are the ones who are going to be stable 
We're going to curate our home libraries. We're going to save the books. We're going to have the 1970s dictionaries. We're going to have the Encyclopedia Britannica's and the Harvard set in our homes so that we will be able to have answers, or at the very least, we can have a, a place where culture is preserved. And when it's time, our children will be ready to rise up with that and have answers for the brokenness that's all around. So do not compromise. <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it, that's just like, it, that's why I say don't put too much money in contemporary books. Just don't. Um, okay, few more points. Unless you have any questions. Any more questions? I love questions. Please do. Forever. And so, like, if, if your home is filled with, like, bookshelf B-size, how many would you fill? <laughs> 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 <library. laughs> so, Should I answer that question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Pre-purge. Pre-purge. Pre <laughs> so I just cleaned up my house, and I got rid of two Billy bookshelves. I have 11 more. I mean, she owns a bookshelf. <laughs> right, I like, like I don't Yes. Well, yes. So to be fair, I, I grew up working in a bookstore. Um, I, I grew up working for a small publisher. Um, and he specialized in looking for old books. And we have, we, I have a lot of them here. Old books that needed, that need to be republished. Good stories. He did a lot of historical fiction, which probably, huh. That's why I like historical fiction. Um, so the things I learned there too was when you're looking, like make notes of authors, right? If you find a good author like Rosemary Sutcliffe, buy anything and everything Rosemary Sutcliffe and read it. Um, Thomas Costain, he's a, a Canadian journalist back in the 1960s, writes incredible stories. Anything Thomas Canadian history book and he added to five more that I think are essential for every bookshelf. I have two, uh, three copies of his book because I just, because I can't, every time I see it, I got to buy it. Um, so, so look for authors and, and buy those authors. The other thing too is publishers, publishing houses, because often a publishing house will have a mandate for a particular reason. So something like Purple House Books is a fantastic publishing house. They only read old books that have, have good stories in them. Um, so that's that's one to keep your eye on. Um, uh, Purple House is one, and then even the book the guy that I used to work with is Inheritance Publications, and he has a wide range of genres, but his historical fiction is just really really good. Um, basically, and so that's kind of how I curated this collection um, by looking at publishers. Bethlehem House is another publisher, fantastic historical fiction. Um, you could just like comb through all the shelves here and that's, that's kind of how I did it. So Rachel on my, on the, the chat here is asking, um, do you have any contemporary recommendations because she would like to support authors that are making an effort? So, I, okay. That's a fantastic, um, question. question. Yeah. Uh, so that's where I would say there, a publishing house that you should go to and keep an eye on for really good contemporary authors is The Rabbit Room. And that's done with Andrew Peterson. Um, Andrew Peterson is singer songwriter and author of the Wingfeather Saga. We love Andrew Peterson. Um, and his, his work down in the States with The Rabbit Room is to cultivate uh, contemporary artists so he works with authors, but he works with um, uh, artists. He works with uh, curators of all things of the humanities. So I would say check out The Rabbit Room. Another contemporary source that we should keep our eye on, that we should support, is called the Anselm Society. So the Anselm, uh, A-N-S-E-L-M. The Anselm Society also works with contemporary artists and uh, promotes these people who are trying to do the good to to do good in in our contemporary world. Have you heard of Wise Wolf? I have not. Wise Wolf.
all thin, right? So then I would say, I would just say, I'm sorry, like we, we can't read this book. I've had, it, I've had conversations, um, my older girls, I will let them now venture out on their own and read their own stories um, that I haven't read. And I will trust that they will come back to me and we'll have conversations if there's something in there. And we've actually had that here in the bookstore where like um, I let my girls read widely and broadly and all this. And one of the girls came to me with a series of books and she's just like, mom, this is such a good story. She tells me the premise of the book. And I was like, that's, that sounds really, really good. Should we bring it into the bookstore? And she's like, absolutely. Um, because I have very strict criteria for what comes on these shelves. Um, because it, I, I don't ever want somebody to buy a book and come and say, hey, um, we don't subscribe to these principles. We don't do this. So, so we brought that series of books in that she really loved <clears throat> and put on the shelf and we advertised it. And Adrienne, my marketing director, she said to me at one point that she's like, have you talked to Ainsley why she's not reading this book? And we had a conversation um, about what was going on in the story um, where they had a friendship, which in the first two books was really nice, but in the third book turned into a marriage. And my sweet, sweet daughter communicated that to me. And we had that conversation. She's like, she felt awkward about it. She's like, this is not okay. This is not. And I was like, I'm so sorry. Like, I, I, I really am sorry that you read that. I'm sorry you were exposed to that. And, and your response is accurate. Like, that is the response we should have. Um, and so for therapy, um, I allowed her to pull the books off the shelf and pull them apart. And we threw them in the dump and we pulled them from the website and we pulled them from advertising and they are no longer on our shelves. Um, we, we had it to one Christmas. We pulled in a Christmas book and a customer called and said, hey, there's this content in the book. Are you sure you want to be endorsing this? And when we followed up, we were like, no, 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 no. And so in that case, we went back to all the customers who had bought the book. We refunded them and we said, we're so sorry. Would you please throw the book away? Mm -hmm. um, but because because it's very easy right now to to just to come across that kind of content um, and to kind of go, oh, but the story's really good. Just like, it's just, yeah, just like, just, just skip that part. Or you know what, you, you don't agree with it. So just read it, but just don't agree with it. But no, we can't do that. We can't normalize sin. We can't let sin be present in our lives without consequence, right? So um, I would also say books for your children that they should just come here and buy the books here or like buy a gift card. Um, <laughs> but no, that, that is like one of our purposes here is to put together a collection of books where you can send your grandparents and aunts and uncles that they know nothing about books, but no matter what, it'll be okay. So another question for someone in a very, very small postage stamp house right now. Yes. Um, what is worth owning versus librarying versus audioing? Like what kind of criteria do you have on something you're going to bring in? Other than like these 50 tactics you're talking about. Um, you know, what, what makes it onto the shelf when it's a very small shelf? Um, keep it to what your children need right now. Yeah. Um, stay away for as much as and hard as it's going to be. Stay away from library sales and book sales and Facebook marketplace because yeah. you'll be tempted beyond what you can bear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> ask me how I know. Yeah. So I would I would keep it to like the really pure classics. Yeah. And and you can cross reference. There's also like a lot of really good book lists that you can cross reference. So if you if you are looking at five different book lists um, and there's like books about books and you're welcome to go through them and cross reference them. You don't have to buy them all. But if if five books are saying you should read Winnie the Pooh, then you should own Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And if they're saying you should read um, most of the motorcycle, well, then you should own that book. But if one book says you should read, um, I don't know, the you should read um, Bill Pete stories, um, and another book says, oh, but you should actually read um, these what, stories over here, then maybe or maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. Um, that I would say is a personal preference. And then with young children's books, like a lot of them need to be reading, they need to be in it. Is there any so? Yeah, I guess. Maybe I'm just thinking out loud, but I'm trying, like, I see books here and I'm like, these are so cute, but I can't afford the shelf space because yeah. I just can't currently. 
So like, yeah. what do you, I guess maybe that's a bit more of a library use. Borrow books from friends. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Borrow books from friends or ask grandparents if they can buy them and have them in their home so that when you bring the kids over, they can read them. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. One more question I want to address because we've had this before is what about graphic novels? Do they count? I think they do, uh, but under very certain criteria. Okay, the art. We have to be so careful with the art. There are graphic novels with art in it that is not appropriate for young boys. And that doesn't mean that it's like, or anybody really. But I'm talking about the ones that are even like, they're graphic novels. They're, they're graphic, <laughs> they're quite graphic. And we're not looking at the words in this case. Um, so we wanna be careful about those ones. I would say like, again, the, stick to the old ones like Asterix and Obelix and Tintin and Calvin and Hobbes, these are fun. Like historical fiction and Asterix and Obelix, I'm all over it. Tintin, all over it, right? So. So yes, graphic novels, especially if you have a struggling reader, right? Or you have a reader who, who just, a, a kid who just, is, let's face it, it's usually the boys. They just need that, right? To give them a boost, by all means, use graphic novels. But be very, very picky because your children cannot unsee what they've seen. Yeah. Um, and then another thing too is we want to be careful that we don't go, we don't read overly virtuous books. And has anybody heard of the Elsie Dinsmore series? Yes. Yes. So if you, if you, if you know, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, this is about a girl, like, these are stories about a, a, a person, like a girl who's like, absolutely perfect. Okay. She cleans her room perfectly, she dresses perfectly, she says yes mother perfectly, then she does her chores perfectly. Yes, she never gets angry. You, you, could like, you could like beat her up on the street and she would stand up and say, I shall pray for you. Would you like to beat up the other side of me? Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> it, it, but the thing is, like as adults, we might, we might go, oh no, this is terrible, but the reality is some, there are people out there who are like, you really need to read this about this little girl. Like this little girl, she knows how to forgive. I'm like, no, actually she doesn't. <laughs> so we, we want to be there. There, Yeah, she needs therapy. There. there are books where the character is overly virtuous and that's not helpful for our children because the character needs to be relatable. If we can't relate, then it, it's, it's hopeless. Unless of course it's like a superhero. We want, we want to attain that, that's great. But if it's just like unattainable, unrealistic, like better than Jesus kind of character, just it's okay to say no. We're not going to read that. That's right. I must be really bad. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And I just want to end with this. Um, we could go on, but I want to end with this because it's been a while. Philippians 4, verse 8. This should be our guide. It says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. You were just saying it with me, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. We can well, we'll get you to do the actions next time. <laughs> Would you like to? After cream. <laughs> okay. Thank you once again so much for coming. If you have more questions, I'm happy to hear them.